For those of you familiar with my content, you probably recognize the name Dr. Beatriz Villarol. For the last couple of months, I have been waiting eagerly for her latest work. For those of you who remember my interview with Dr. Villarol, she hinted at the fact that she and her team had made other discoveries that were going to be put forward in a paper this summer. And when it comes to the field of serious scientific UAP, research, these discoveries are going to shake the foundation of what the scientific community thinks they know about the UAP phenomenon. Well, that paper has now come out, although just a preprint and it is yet to be peer-reviewed. I think it's very possible that it's not going to be peer-reviewed by respected scholarly journals simply because the scientific community has been blacklisting anybody who talks about subjects like this recently, regardless of what evidence they might have. But nevertheless, it's important that we get the findings out to the general public and let people know, including the layman who may not understand a lot of astronomical terminology, what these discoveries mean and why they are so significant. So I'm going to bring you all the details of this preprint and what it means to the UAP phenomenon right now. Good afternoon, and once again, welcome to another Angry Alien Bulletin. For those of you who are thinking that my channel is completely transitioned over to nothing but UFO and 3i Atlas topics, I strongly reassure you that that is not the case. It's just these sorts of stories have been popping up a lot lately and deserve immediate attention, but I'll be doing a lot of spaceflight stuff here soon, so just hang in there, spaceflight fans. In the meantime, as far as this discovery is concerned, the best way to look at this, if you are not familiar with Beatrice Villarol's work, is how many UAP sightings tend to be explained away as mundane human manufactured objects, aircraft, satellites, helicopters, that sort of thing. So many UAP sightings can be explained away because of those mundane causes. However, what if you had events taking place in the sky where helicopters and aircraft cannot be reasonable explanations and there are no satellites at all? And this is what Beatrice Velarol and her team of astronomers have been focusing on. Let me show you what I'm talking about. This particular footage captured in Australia probably shows two satellites in the same constellation chasing one another in low Earth orbit. And then all of a sudden, the cameraman spots something else, an object that's flashing periodically and making its way across the sky in a trajectory that swerves back and forth. But what if the original sighting, that is to say the two satellites chasing one another across the sky, happened before there were no human satellites? And again, this is what Beatrice Villarol and her team were trying to do, examining photographic plates taken at the Mount Palomar Observatory in the 1950s, looking for these same kinds of patterns. Multiple objects in a line that are in formation and therefore very unlikely anything natural traveling through the sky again very much like human satellites except in the early to mid 1950s years before sputnik made its historic flight so let's go ahead and read the introduction to this paper just to get a quick overview as to what these astronomers were working on quote old digitized astronomical images taken before the human spacefaring age offer a rare glimpse of the sky before the era of our artificial satellites. In this paper, we present the first optical searches for artificial objects with high specular reflections near the Earth. We use images from the first Palomar Sky Survey to search for multiple transients that, in addition to being point-like, are aligned along a narrow band. We provide a short list of the most promising candidates. As in previous cases, no known astrophysical or instrumental experiments 
explanations fully account for these events. We explore remaining possibilities, including fast reflections from highly reflective objects in geosynchronous orbits or emissions from artificial sources high above Earth's atmosphere. Most notably, one candidate coincides in time with the Washington, D.C. 1952 UFO outbreak, and another falls within a day of the peak of the 1954 UFO outbreak. We also find a highly significant deficit of transients within Earth's shadow, supporting the interpretation that sunlight reflection plays a key role in producing these events. Now, what is it about the Earth's shadow that's a big deal here? Well, I'll cover that in just a moment. Let's go ahead and talk a little bit more about the paper. A week ago, shockwaves reverberated around the UAP world when Beatriz Villarol's Ocean X research partner on the Baltic Sea anomaly, Dennis Asberg, announced new findings on the UAP front that he is sure will shock the world. He's since deleted the tweet, but in any event, this attracted my attention. I asked Dr. Villarol what he was talking about. She thought it was probably more about the Baltic Sea anomaly. But once again, having read this preprint, I cautiously agree with Mr. Asberg. This is a very significant discovery, and I'll explain why as we go along. Let's continue. Quote, transient star-like objects of unknown origin have been identified in the first Palomar Observatory Sky Survey conducted prior to the first artificial satellite. We tested speculative hypotheses that some transients are related to nuclear weapons testing or unidentified anomalous phenomena reports. Now, why would it be related to nuclear weapons testing? Well, at the time, in the 1950s, many nuclear bombs were going off in Nevada, the Marshall Islands, and other regions controlled by the United States. And interestingly enough, the transients that pop up in these photographic plates are 45% more likely to happen within plus or minus one day of a nuclear test taking place. In addition, the researchers drew a direct connection between the number of transients that were popping up in these photographic plates plates and the number of UFO reports that were being made at the time. An increase of 8.5% in the number of transients appearing in the photographic plates occurred for every UFO sighting that happened at the same period of time. A direct connection between the frequency of UFO sightings and the appearance of these objects in our night sky. So let me show you a few examples of these plates and why they are so significant. The plate on the left is the one where the transients were discovered. The plate on the right came about an hour later. As you can see, the transients, which are marked by blue circles, disappeared shortly after being photographed. In addition to that, several of them are closely arranged in a line formation, very similar to the way satellites in a constellation would appear, assuming satellites actually exist existed in the 1950s, which they did not, at least not in the early to mid-1950s when all of these photographs were taken. In addition to that, these examples cannot be meteors, nor can they be asteroids, nor can they be supernova or any other type of phenomena. Asteroids moving quick enough to disappear in only an hour would leave a streak on a time exposure photograph, not appearing as a pinpoint. The only thing that would appear as a pinpoint in the night sky that would disappear in an hour or so would be something that was sitting in geosynchronous orbit, which then departed geosynchronous orbit before the next photographs were taken, or perhaps the objects rotated in such a way that they didn't reflect sunlight in the same way as they were when they were photographed the first time. This is the second candidate. There are four transients in this one, and as you can see, three of those transients are arranged in a line with two of them appearing very close to one another. Again, something that is completely unlike a meteor phenomena or asteroids, definitely nothing like supernova. You won't 
ever have four supernova taking place at the same time and also supernova don't disappear in less than an hour there is no known natural phenomena that could account for these transients appearing and disappearing in an hour's time however there is one man-made possibility to this phenomena something created by humans that theoretically could cause these transients to appear in these photographic plates and that is the nuclear tests that have occurred in greater frequency in association with these photographic plates than these transients appearing when there were no nuclear tests radioactive contamination can sometimes cause these sorts of flaws to appear in photographic plates however if that were the case then that means these transients should be appearing completely at random radioactive contamination has no perceivable pattern they shouldn't be occurring on a line or in any kind of formation and most significantly these sorts of transients should also be appearing in the earth's shadow radioactive contamination could give a damn as to where the earth's shadow happens to be when the photograph was taken and yet these transients do not appear where earth shadow would interfere with their appearance that is to say earth shadow would obscure any sort of object reflecting sunlight in orbit and on all of these photographic plates almost none of the transients appear where earth shadow would interfere with it again this completely eliminates radioactive contamination as being a possible culprit for these transients again we are left with nothing but artificial phenomena taking place in orbit or some sort of extraterrestrial natural phenomena that we have never observed any place else and the candidates go on and on this is figure four as it is described in the paper and it shows six transients four of which appear in a line formation again very similar to a starlink constellation or some other satellite formation although you have in two cases two transients appearing very close to one another again a very strange phenomena that theoretically might be caused by gravity gravitational lensing that sometimes can create duplicates in the same photographic plate but again gravitational lensing of what of a supernova that again is impossible that shouldn't have disappeared in only an hour these sorts of things can only be attributed to artificial causes at least as far as astronomical phenomena that we are currently aware of now, perhaps my favorite example is candidate number five, which has five transients, but all of them are clustered into the same formation, all arranged on a line with two transients appearing very close to one another at one end of the line and two more transients closely clustered at the other end of the line. This looks beyond artificial, not just to me, I think to just about any reasonable person. This cannot be be anything natural five objects appearing in the same formation four of which appear in pairs as a matter of fact if you measure the distance from one pair to the center object and then from the other pair also to the center object you will find that these objects are almost equidistant from the center that also is an amazing coincidence again in my opinion not a coincidence at all but an artificial formation in orbit again it has to be in geosynchronous orbit if it were in low earth orbit it would leave a streak on a time exposure photograph if it were in the atmosphere it would also leave a streak the only way that these objects can possibly appear in these plates in these beautiful pinpoints of light that as i say vanish an hour later is if they are highly reflective objects traveling in geosynchronous orbit and therefore stationary in the sky relative to the stars moving around them that's the only solution that makes any sense with what the team observed in the mount palomar plates now also even if it were some sort of natural phenomenon that we are unfamiliar with some sort of brief flash that 
strangely appears in several different locations in the sky and in formation, even if there, this were somehow natural. How would there be an association with events taking place on Earth? Why would these transients appear more frequently in the aftermath of a nuclear test? Why would they appear more frequently when UAP sightings were more prevalent? Why would there be these direct associations with events taking place in the night sky and events taking place here on Earth? I can think of no other explanation aside from an artificial one of extraterrestrial visitors paying attention to our planet and to our civilization when we're testing nuclear weapons or for some other reason while they were investigating our planet and our civilization in large numbers in the 1950s. And again, to emphasize, this could be happening right now as well, but with all of the man-made satellites that we have in orbit at the moment, these things could be sitting there keeping us under observation without us even being aware of their presence. And it is for this reason that Dr. Villarol and her team, which by the way is comprised of many, many respected astronomers across the planet, it is for this reason that they argue that we should be looking for evidence of extraterrestrial intelligence not in distant stars, not thousands of light years away and listening for faint radio transmissions taking place at the hydrogen line, nor should we be looking at grainy UFO footage online that could very well be faked by increasingly sophisticated AI these days. Instead, there should be a concerted effort on the part of the space agencies of the world, of NASA, of ESA, of JAXA, and other organizations like them to find objects in orbit that should not be there, objects that we cannot account for. And once we have those objects identified, to take a close look at them to see whether or not they might be the product of an extraterrestrial civilization that's been keeping us under surveillance from right under our noses. Thank you very much for watching. I will keep you up to date on all the new developments with this study and also, of course, 3 Eye Atlas. Got some new stuff to talk to you about that as well. Please don't forget to like and subscribe and also please consider supporting this channel on Patreon. As I've said for a little while now, I've got a new video coming out. Unfortunately, still in recovery. It's really been slowing down my ability to create late still not totally over this infection, but I'm definitely getting there. Thanks again for all the well wishes. I really appreciate it. And finally, as you may have noticed, this video is dedicated to David Hender, the most generous supporter of my channel. Without his support, I think there's a very good chance that my head would not be above water right now. It's because of people like David that my channel exists and that I can cover controversial topics like this especially if that coverage requires that I travel to the ends of the earth. Thanks again, David, and thanks again to everyone else for watching. And until next time, stay angry about space.